our topic, and this is the we're going to look at the fear of God, a biblical analysis, or and part two. And uh, I'm starting in a weird place. We're in the middle of looking at the fear of God and worship. And uh, but I'll read from Deuteronomy uh, 17, and uh, you'll know why later. Beginning at verse 17. And this is talking about the requirements for a king in Israel, which won't, won't even happen for hundreds of years. Nor shall he multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. And then oh, let me start at verse 18. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests and Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life. And here's the important point. In order that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. That his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom and he and his children in the midst of Israel. So we're gonna. That's gonna be our next point when I finish up. I got a few things to say about worship, and then we're gonna talk about. You can. The Bible speaks of learning to fear the Lord, and then it associates the fear of the Lord with the Word of God. Now we're in the midst of talking about worship, so I'll, I'll finish this up, and then we'll turn to our next point. The second commandment requires that we only worship and serve the true God in a way that the Lord Himself has instituted in His Word. There is to be no human autonomy in worship and by logical implication, salvation or ethics as well. It is for these reasons that reverence toward God is associated with a strict obedience to his instituted worship and law. Okay, so when you see these churches and the pastors up there cracking jokes and it's all entertainment and it's all designed and the people are applauding and it's all designed like a show, that is not reverence to God. That's that's honoring man. The Puritans and Reformed churches in their early faithful days, they're not very faithful today, there's a few small groups, understood that God is jealous of his worship and service. They understood that fear and reverence and respect for God involved not anything of your own to his worship, to what our Lord has commanded or authorized. Human creativity and invention, innovation, is very fine, it's noble in circumstantial matters of life, such as art, design, music, architecture. It's a wonderful thing. But when we worship and serve the Lord God Almighty, who is infinitely holy, awesome, glorious, incomprehensible, we must carefully, diligently, and habitually obey exactly what God authorizes, no more, no less. And that's not the way people think anymore. People don't think that way today. People think that if you're sincere and you want to make up something, God will honor your sincerity. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we're to approach him in worship only as he is authorized in his word. And everything we do in worship has to be proved either by command or good and necessary consequence. Or, or we could say logical inference from scripture. For this reason, we see that fear, a deep reverence, and loyalty to God is taught clearly or implied in many texts. Moses says, Exodus 15, 11, Who is like you, O Lord, glorious in holiness? David writes, Psalm 5, 7, In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. David also says, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. 2.11 and that's the command to kings, to the resurrected Christ, who is to be worshipped as God. <coughs> Rejoice with trembling. Fear God. Fear the risen Christ. And then, of course, the psalm ends, warning kings, if they don't, they will be destroyed. Paul commands us saying, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. 
We worship and serve a God that is so holy, glorious, and dreadful in his nature that serving and worshiping him must be in fear and reverence. The stronger our faith, the stronger and more consistent will be our reverential fear. And this is very clearly taught in Scripture, but this is, runs counter to modern professing Christendom widely today. This generation has seen what we call the church growth movement. And you have these mega churches. And what is the basis of the church growth movement? The whole basis is make worship pleasing to man, unregenerate man, with lots of entertainment, lots of singing, performance groups, drama groups. The pastor tells great stories and he's a comedian. And you're going to grow the church. You're going to have a big, huge church. But what's absent from these churches? The fear of God. It's humanism. It's a form of humanism. It's entertainment. The weaker our faith, the more we will see laxness, carelessness, compromise, syncretism, and disobedience. With this teaching in mind, we understand why our secular humanistic culture emphatically rejects the fear of God in favor of idolatry, blasphemy, and lawlessness. Now, you understand as our culture has moved away from the fear of the Lord, predominantly since the Civil War, and then it really got growing a lot after, 19, after World War I, where the, where the modernism or liberalism took over all the mainline denominations. Uh, even then, even then, people were afraid to blaspheme. But not today. There's all these atheists that love to blaspheme. And our political leaders are fully are blasphemers as well. Atheists, comedians, and apologists boldly mock the Bible and blaspheme God with their satanic analysis of reality. A culture that does not reverence the true God is on a path to judgment and destruction. You reap what you sow. You mock God. You blaspheme God. You spit on God's law. You will be destroyed. Evangelical Armenian churches, which have a heretical humanistic concept of salvation, do not show the fear of God in their worship. For their worship is unauthorized and humanistic. In the Old Testament, when Israel was fully involved in syncretism and idolatry, through Jeremiah the prophet, God said, what are you doing? I'm paraphrasing. I didn't command this. This doesn't please me. People have this idea. It's so common. Well, if you're sincere, God will honor that and God will accept it. That's existentialism. That's not biblical Christianity. Those people who flew the airplanes into the Twin Towers, they were very sincere. Those Orthodox Jews who were spitting, it's on YouTube, I saw it. The Christians were celebrating Easter and they, you know, their idolatrous nonsense where they're carrying a cross around. As the Orthodox Jews walked by the Christians, they all turned and spit on them. Or at least toward them. A worship geared to the flesh and pleasing fallen men is often simply a mediocre imitation of Hollywood, Las Vegas, and Broadway. Rock bands, drama groups, comedian pastors have nothing in common with the reverential fear involved in biblical worship. I know, I, you know, when I was first a professing Christian in the 70s, I was a charismatic. And I attended one of these mega churches. And I was a really good drummer, and I, I played with bands. I actually played with some pretty famous Christian musicians. I even played in a church orchestra in a giant Assemblies of God church. And um, it's all entertainment. It's all entertainment. The judgments that God at times executed on men who corrupted his worship or ordinances with invention, pragmatism, and humanism are designed to teach godly fear and worship. That's why you see judgments associated with corrupting worship in the Old Testament. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, were slain by fire from heaven for their pragmatism. 
for their following their own idea apart from the Lord's appointment. Leviticus 10, 1 to 2. Fire came out from the altar and devoured them. The punishment of Nadab and Abihu with death seems absurdly harsh for modern ears. Look, they were sincere. They were trying to please the Lord. What's God doing killing them with fire? But God's explanation clarifies the situation. Leviticus 10.3 By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So when you deny biblical worship, when you deny approaching God solely as he has commanded in his word, you're denying the holiness of God. The holiness of God is connected to the fear of God. Fearing God means approaching him solely as he is appointed in his word. The sin of corrupting God's worship with fat is an assault. With pragmatism, autonomy, humanism is an assault on Yahweh's holiness. It is an arrogant denial of the need to fear God. It profanes what God has said is holy. The attitude of Scripture is the exact opposite of how most professing Christians think about approaching God in worship today. And this, this uh, effective dispensationalism, which has really corrupted almost all of evangelicalism in the 20th century, this idea that God's Old Testament law, and we're talking about the moral law, Obviously, the ceremonial laws have been abrogated. Obviously, those laws that are only connected to the land of Israel have been abrogated. But there's a whole ton of moral laws outside the Ten Commandments. And we're told those are abrogated too. Reformed churches today, the theonomy movement, for example... Nobody, nobody's going to tolerate sins against the second table, sins against man. Churches don't, evangelical churches and reformed churches don't tolerate adultery or fornication or homosexuality. Well, they're started, some of them are today starting to tolerate it. And they do, they're all, evangelical churches are very soft on uh, unlawful mar uh, divorce, which is a form of adultery. The Bible's views on divorce and remarriage are super strict. If you get divorced and it's unlawful divorce, you're not allowed to get remarried. So you better stick to your wife. <laughs> There's only, you can only get divorced for the cause of fornication. If you don't get caused because of adultery or fornication and you dump your wife and marry somebody else, the Bible says you're committing adultery. But anyway, that's another topic. But the point is, is that you don't see churches tolerating, in general, sins against the second table of the law. They take them very seriously. They don't tolerate theft. Fraud, adultery, fornication, murder, or homosexuality. But corruptions or human additions in worship are perfectly fine. To think in this way is to accept the building while rejecting the foundation. And it is one reason, I think a major reason, why the Christian Reconstruction Movement has, generally speaking, been a total failure. Why is the Christian Reconstruction, the Theonomy Movement, a failure? Because it's antinomian. James Jordan, David Chilton. These people are anti-biblical worship. They're anti-second commandment. They're anti-first table of the law. Gary North wrote an article against the Sabbath. You can't say, well, we need to obey God's law. Society needs that. And yet the church can have total autonomy with regard to the first table. That movement's not going to succeed. The second table rests upon the first table of the law. They want a strict application of the moral law by the civil government. A kind of regulative principle for the state. And there's even an article, I have all the Christian journals of Christian Reconstruction, there's even an article by Jim West called The Regular Principle of the State. And it's a great article. I agree with Jim West. The state is not allowed to make up laws out of thin air that are moral in content. They have to base everything on the word of God. Yet they want churches to be free to autonomously decide for their own rites and ceremonies. And there's a trend among uh, theonomists toward Episcopalianism, high churchism, pedo communion, sacramentalism, and then, of course, that led to the federal vision, which is a heresy denying justification by faith alone. The movement's been a failure. 
there are some guys that are solid. Bonson wasn't into this stuff, although he was soft on uh, Norman Shepard. He didn't understand what Norman Shepard was really teaching. And Ken Gentry's been rock solid uh, on eschatology. With one arm, they seek to build on the Puritan concept of biblical law. While with the other, they act like prelatists who tear down the wall in the church. And if you don't fear God and honor him with biblical worship, don't expect a Christian reconstruction of society. For the church must reform itself before it can work to reform the state. According to scripture, the only way to honor God's word and character and worship is to not add to what the Bible requires, nor detract from it. Deuteronomy 4.2 and 12.32, and then there's a ton of other passages. James Durham says this, It is a sin not only to worship false gods, but to worship the true God in a false way. And Zachary Ursinus concurs, Quote, the other species of idolatry is more subtle and refined, as when the true God is supposed to be worshipped, while it's the kind of worship which is painted to him as false, which is the case when anyone imagines that he is worshipping or honoring God by the performance of any work not prescribed by the divine law. This species of idolatry is more properly condemned in the second commandment, and is termed superstition because it adds to the commandments of God the inventions of men. And why is the regular principle so in such a sad state among Reformed churches today? Because when you break the law of God, when you add to the worship of God, you corrupt the worship of God, which is what's happening in the OPC and the PCA and many conservative Dutch communions. You have to ignore the regular principle because... You're denying it by your practice. You don't have any choice. The sons of Eli were killed by the wicked Philistines because they did not fear God and repeatedly profaned holy things. They were fornicating in the precincts of the temple. They were only allowed to take meat after it had been cooked, and they were taking fresh meat, fresh cuts of meat for themselves in violation of the law. And they did not listen to their father who warned them. 1 Samuel 2.25 If anyone sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? 1 Samuel 2.25 Eli was a wise man who sadly did not discipline his sons. And he paid for it. I believe he was a true believer. I don't, I don't think his sons were at all. They were unregenerate. They were spoiled brats. God killed a friend of David's for touching the Holy Ark and not using the Levites who were authorized to use poles to move the Ark as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. 1 Chronicles 15, 13 to 15. They were moving the Ark. They thought they were doing a good thing. But they did one. They did. They forgot to do one thing: consult the Word of God on how they were supposed to move the ark. That's all they did. You're not allowed to use an ox cart, and you're not allowed to touch the ark. And God killed him. David was upset about it. <laughs> David was upset about it. He left the ark sitting in a, in a certain town for quite a while, and God was blessing all the people in that town. So David finally moved the ark to the right place. Many Christians think that God was strict in the Old Testament, but in the New Covenant era, he has relaxed such strictness so that we are free to follow the Spirit. And this is the argument of, of Steve Slissel from New York, who wrote a, bunch of, a series of articles that were published in the Chalcedon Report against the regular principle. And I have a refutation of it on reformedonline.com. You should read my refutation, because the arguments are stupid, and they're the same arguments used by people like Doug Wilson. They're stupid arguments. And such thinking is in error for a number of reasons. Number one, the requirement to obey God and not add or subtract from what he has commanded is not arbitrary or positivistic, but flows from God's holy nature and character. 
God's moral law is not arbitrary. It's based on his nature and character. We have to approach God in a certain way because that, of who God is. He's holy. By way of analogy, let's say you're going to meet the Queen of England. You don't walk in there wearing a pair of cutoffs and you're, you're all filthy wearing a t-shirt with grease on it smoking a cigarette. There's a, there's a way to do it. You have to be dressed in a tuxedo and you have to do all this stuff. Well, God's infinitely holy. We're not allowed to approach God how we want. Same for salvation. There's only one way to go to God, through Christ. And there's a reason for that. Because God is holy. He cannot tolerate sin. Number two. Although the New Covenant Church now has a completed, perfect revelation from God and a greater effusion of the Holy Spirit, the requirement of sola scriptura has not changed. For God remains the same, and the church still has a ministerial role, not a creative role when it comes to doctrine, ethics, or worship. And that's why we have liberty. The elders of your church, if you do something wrong, they point it out using the Bible, and they tell you to repent. <laughs> if you don't repent, eventually you'll be excommunicated. But they don't have the authority to make up rules. They don't have the authority to institute discipline for things that are not sinful. They have no authority. Their authority resides in the Word of God. Their job is ministerial, and that's true of worship. They don't have any authority to make up worship ordinances and impose them on you. If your church celebrates Christmas... Tell your pastor and your elders, I'm not going to church that day. I'll go somewhere else. I'm not going to partake of this sinful, wicked activity, which is not commanded in Scripture. Number three, and people understand the church doesn't have the right to make up their own doctrines. Only, well, Roman Catholics believe that. But evangelicals don't believe you can make it. They don't believe you can have more than two sacraments. They don't believe you can make up your own doctrines. But when it comes to worship, oh, yeah, you do whatever you want. God didn't forbid it explicitly. So if we want a rock band and we want a, 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 a group up there doing drama, why not? Three, the fact that even regenerate men are still fallen creatures who must continually battle the flesh in ignorance renders Christians unfit to approach God in worship as they please. It's one thing that we're finite. We're creatures. We need revelation. Even before the fall, Adam walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the garden. They weren't allowed to make up ethics. They weren't allowed to make up reality. They had to face the reality as God had made it, and they had to obey God's voice. But once you're sinful, once you're fallen, that especially applies. We can't be trusted to make up our own worship. We just can't, can't be trusted. One can, uh, Number four, one must never confuse Christian liberty with human autonomy. And I, I, this is very common in evangelical circles, even some reform circles. Christian liberty means that we are free from the doctrines and commandments of men. That's what Christian liberty means. Because people say, oh, Brian's against Christian liberty. He doesn't believe in Christmas. No, no, no. We're free from the doctrines and commandments of men. We're not free to disregard what God says in his word. If you tell me, well, you can't have, fish on, you can't have meat on Fridays... And my thing is, well, prove it in the word of God and I'll obey it. If you can't prove it, you don't have the authority to say that. Our liberty resides in knowing, believing, and obeying the infallible word of God. We are free to learn the, the truth and obey it. We are not to create our own ideas, ordinances, and rules. And such thinking always leads to tyranny and Romanism. You've got the Pope defrocking conservative ministers today, bishops in the Roman Catholic Church. Why? He doesn't like what they're saying. He has no arguments from the Bible. It's just, I'm the Pope. Do what I say, shut up and obey me. And he's a socialist. The words of Girodo on the fear of God and worship were very helpful. Here's what he says, quote, God is seen manifesting a most vehement jealousy in protecting the purity of his worship. 
any attempt to assert the judgment, the will, the taste of man apart from the express warrant of his word, and to introduce into his worship human inventions, devices, and methods, was overtaken by immediate retribution and rebuked by the thunderbolts of his wrath. Nor need we wonder at this, for the service which the creature professes to render to God reaches its highest and most formal expression in the worship which is offered to him. In this act, the majesty of the Most High is directly confronted. The worshiper presents himself face to face with the infinite sovereign of heaven and earth, and assumes to lay at his feet the sincerest homage of the heart. In the performance of such an act to violate divine appointments or transcend divine prescription, to affirm the reason of a sinful creature against the authority of God is deliberately to flaunt an insult in his face and to hurl an indignity against his throne. What else could follow but the flash of divine indignation? It is true that in the New Testament dispensation, the same swift and visible arrest of this sin is not the ordinary rule. But the patience and forbearance of God can constitute no justification of its commission. Its punishment, if it not be repented of, is only deferred. In other words, in the Old Testament, God obviously would do these rapid judgments to show the people the holiness of the Lord, that you've got to approach him exactly as he has commanded, not add to it, not detract from it. Well, in the New Testament, you don't see that. Now, Annas and Sapphira lied to the apostles and kept back the money, and they, they were struck dead. But normally, you don't see that today. But he's saying the judgment will come. It's just deferred. Corporate worship that God himself has instituted brings us into a special presence in a unique manner that should cause a solemnity, a carefulness, an exactness that corresponds to the fear of God. That's why this modern worship, where the pastor is basically an entertainer, he's not up there expositing scripture and just laying out what scripture teaches and trying to apply it. He's up there entertaining, cracking jokes, telling a lot of stories. There might be a little teaching in there, but the whole worship service is is is, is a mockery of biblical worship. His instituted worship is the most holy and glorious practice under the sun. Public worship. His character is honored by his ordinances. His eye looks upon his worshipers and his wrath and judgment will be upon those that worship without a holy fear. That obeys and honors his ordinances. Do you fear God? Do you, do you fear God? Well, do you obey him in worship? Are you adding to what the worship of God? For this reason, we must never approach God in worship with our own inventions or ideas. And we must not come to worship while mistreating our brothers in Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 23, Matthew 5, 23 to 24. Factionalism, treating brothers like dirt is inconsistent with the worship of God. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 that there's some who are dead because of it. The establishment of our covenant relationship through Christ is to bring us into a loving, harmonious bond with God, which must lead to true biblical worship in the fear of Yahweh. This means a strict adherence to the worship elements divinely instituted in the word, coupled with a sincere faith and grace in the heart which God requires as holy belonging unto him. <clears throat> to make sure that we pay close attention to these commands and take them very seriously, Yahweh reminds us that he is a consuming fire. God wants us to always keep in mind the holiness of his nature and the severity and inescapability of his justice against unrepentant sinners. There is a special jealousy regarding his worship due to worship's importance and are entering into the special presence of Christ. 
And that is why if we're going to talk about the law of God and we're going to talk about how our society needs God's law, and it certainly does. That's You see the democratic societies where they're just crime is so bad now that businesses are closing down left and right and people are fleeing the cities because crime because the democrats are antinomian and they're in favor of crime because they their view of of ethics is uh, based on racism and marxism it's not based on the bible And of course, this point is especially clear in the Apostles' discussion of the Holy Supper. It is compared to a wedding feast, a banquet with Christ. On the one hand, we must keep in mind what an amazing privilege it is to be saved by Jesus and brought into his great kingdom of grace. Yet on the other hand, we must never forget our covenant responsibilities and just how obnoxious, dishonoring, and ungrateful breaking the covenant through sin and negligence is. And this is especially true with regard to sins relating to worship. And this is not the opinion of just the Puritans. This is not the opinion of just the early Presbyterians, first and uh, second Reformation Presbyterians. It's not, it's not something unique. Read your Old Testament. It's all over the Old Testament. It's very clear. It's very, very clear. <clears throat> When secular humanists reject biblical laws relating to fornication, blasphemy, adultery, and homosexuality, they are saying that God's law is not good. They're mocking God. They're spitting on his law. It is wrong. It is immoral. It is unjust. They're saying my ideas on ethics are better. Your authority does not apply to me. I am my own God, and I get to make the rules. When professing Christians ignore what the Bible teaches and authorizes regarding worship, they are implicitly teaching that, number one, God's word is not sufficient to regulate worship. It needs man's invention. And if you go back and you read the debates between the early Episcopalians, the early Prelatists, and the early Puritans, I think it was Hooker, and there was debates, and the Episcopalians their, whole, their, their main argument was, well, the Bible just outlines some things very generally and doesn't go into details. We're, God wants us to fill in the details. God wants us to make up the, the, the particulars of worship. That was their argument. Their argument was basically the Bible's not sufficient. And that's a bald-faced lie. Number two, it assumes sinful man can come up with better ideas for worship than God himself. You guys sing psalms without musical instruments? You sing the word of God? We've got rock bands, man. We've got people up and down dancing and clapping their hands and shouting and dancing about. And look how big our churches are. We know better than God. Your church is small. Our church is big. We've got drama groups. It's fun, man. We've got all these programs for the kids. Look at all this stuff we have. And God hates all of it because it's not commanded. He didn't authorize it. It doesn't impress God one bit how big your church is. God doesn't care how big your church is. He cares if you're faithful. What's important is, are you faithful? And then, of course, they assume three. Worship should be man-centered, not God-centered. And number four, men can approach Yahweh on their own terms rather than on God's terms. That's the assumption. And I admit, when I was an ignorant Arminian fool, and I'd go to my charismatic church, and the rock and roll band's jamming, and the bass player's playing a good solo, and really great singers, and beautiful women get up there and sing, and everybody claps. It was very entertaining. It's not as good as Jimi Hendrix or the Beatles, but I mean, it was fun. But it's not commanded. There's nothing wrong with entertainment, but it doesn't belong. Church is, church is not for us to be entertained. Church is for us to glorify God and obey his word. Such thinking, of course, is humanistic and completely ignores the biblical teaching on God's holiness. Worship is the way it is because God is holy. Salvation is the way it is because God is holy. Holy. 
and righteous and cannot tolerate sin. And that brings us to our next point. The fear of God and the Word. I'm getting these points directly out of Scripture. Although the fear of God is something required or commanded of all men, simply because of who Yahweh is, He's the Creator. He created everything. You know, there's over, they estimate there's over a trillion galaxies. Over a trillion galaxies. That's a pretty awesome God. That's pretty amazing. And of course, who we are. We're finite. We're created. And then, of course, we're sinful creatures. And if you're a Christian, you're saved by grace alone. You're not saved by yourself. It is also something that can be learned and increased by the study of God's word. And that brings us back to Deuteronomy 17, 18 to 20. Also, it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom. That's a prophecy about the future king. That he shall write for himself a copy of this book in the law from the one before the priests and the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life every day until he dies, that he may learn to fear the Lord, his God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. So if somebody says, oh, I don't read the Bible. It's boring. I don't have time. I'm surfing the web. I'm having fun. I'm playing video games. I don't need to read the Bible. No. Do you want to fear the Lord more? Well, you got to read the Bible. Verse 20. That his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So the kings of Israel were required to write out a copy of the law, from, of the whole law, from the copy kept by the Levites, first in the tabernacle, and then later in the temple complex. They had the original. There was an original autograph of the word of God and that was to be used by the king he would write down since Deuteronomy is a covenant renewal document this copy would include the whole prior revelation the five books of Moses the Torah the Torah contains the whole moral law which is a revelation of God's holiness and righteousness it is the standard of sanctification separation or holiness of the people of God the moral law was given to a redeemed people, not simply as a guide for personal holiness, but also as a means of properly maintaining a covenant relationship with God. It's not some impersonal document. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's almost like a love letter from God. The moral law does not and cannot save anyone. Let's make that perfectly clear. Roman Catholicism is a lie. The federal vision is a damnable heresy. Eastern Orthodoxy teaches a lie. We're not saved by following the law. It doesn't contribute one iota. But it's a very personal document, similar to a marriage contract, which is designed to maintain and nurture the people of God's loving relationship with an infinitely holy God. You're saved. How should we then live? We're brought into a right relationship with God. How do we maintain that relationship? What does God want of us as his bride? Now, unbelievers are obligated to obey the moral law as creatures. They were created by God. God has total authority over all. But believers are obligated as wives, Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, and sons, Romans 8, 15, Galatians 4, 5, Ephesians 1, 5. And of course, there's other passages that talk about the church being the bride. There's three or four in the Old Testament, and there's some in Revelation. The way for us to show a reverential fear of God is to learn and obey his commandments. The king is required to read the Torah all the days of his life so that he knows what is in it, for it is the source of truth, meaning, ethics, and covenant loyalty. So this idea, well, there are many ways to God, that's a lie. This idea, well, I'm going to, I'm going to be spiritual. I'm not a Christian, but I'm going to be spiritual and forge my own path. That's a lie of the devil. Gets you nowhere. The purpose of reading it is threefold. One, in order that he may learn to fear the Lord as God. Two, habitually obey all of God's laws and statutes. Covenant loyalty. Covenant faithfulness. No, it's not sinlessness. We'll never be sinful this side of heaven. 
but we want a habitual obedience. Three, and not be filled with pride as the political leader <coughs> and thus add or detract from its requirements. People who add to the word of God, that's all based on pride. That's all based on a love of human autonomy, which is based on pride. The fear of the Lord is connected to a love and obedience toward the moral law. <coughs> a reading of scripture teaches us who God is. There's a creator-creature distinction. God is absolutely sovereign over the universe and man. Therefore, he makes the rules. We are obligated to love and obey him. He is the source of all truth, meaning, and ethics. Everything derives its meaning and purpose from God. He is transcendent, glorious, ethically perfect, and completely separate from all moral evil. 1 John 1, 5, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. His character of absolute ethical holiness and ethical perfection is why Yahweh cannot tolerate, accept, or overlook sin. This is one of the arguments of all these stupid atheists. Oh, God gets all upset about sin, he has to kill Christ. What a ridiculous doctrine. God is holy. God is righteous. Do you want an immoral God? Of course not. He can't overlook sin because he's absolutely perfectly holy and righteous. Habakkuk 1.3, you are of pure eyes to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Psalm 5.4, you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. Psalm 7.11, God is a just judge and is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 9.17, the wicked shall be turned into hell. The holiness of God is revealed in the moral law. The character of God <coughs> determines how his people should live. You hear about, what would Christ do? The imitation of Christ. Well, Christ is fully man and fully God, and he lived an ethically perfect life. He, he obeyed God's will perfectly. As the image of God, he was moral in his conscience. Oh, excuse me. Man was created with true righteousness, holiness, and knowledge. Ephesians 4.24 and Colossians 3.10. We know that because Christ restores that when you become a Christian. As the image of God, he was moral in his conscience and his behavior was naturally good, righteous and holy. But because of sin, he needs a perspicuous revealed law to show him his sin and guilt. Romans 7.7-12, 7 Galatians 3.22-25. And teach him how to walk humbly before God. The more we learn the moral law, the more the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin and cause us to fear God. We're saved, but we're sinners. The more we fear God, the more we will love the moral law and meditate on it night and day. Psalm 119, 5, 7, 9, 11, 15, and 27, etc. We study the scriptures daily so that God's principles, ethics, thinking, and wisdom can become our own. We are to think God's thoughts after him. Our thinking is to be receptively reconstructive, not autonomous. And those who think they can do what they please and God will be pleased with that, if, as long as they're sincere, which is existentialism, are living in self-deception. They follow human autonomy, which means they are controlled by sinful lusts and ignorance. The Christian's thinking must be receptively reconstructed, and he learns what God has to say, and then he believes it, and he puts it into practice. Even if you may not totally agree at first or understand, you trust in the Lord and you lean not, lean not on your own understanding. God's always right. If your thinking contradicts what God says, your thinking is wrong. If you believe in macroevolution or you believe that homosexuality is good, your thinking is abysmally wrong. And this point is brought out in Deuteronomy 28, 58 to 59 where habitual practice of God's moral law is necessary to learn the fear of God and avoid the curses of the covenant. Listen to this. If you do not carefully observe all the words of the law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, Yahweh, Elohim, 
then the Lord will bring you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. The holy law reflects God's holiness, and those who disregard God's law will receive the curses of the covenant. Evangelicals who re generally reject the Old Testament law, moral law, and are very syncretistic in their thinking, send their kids to public schools, which is like a Jew sending his children to a school that worships Baal. Public schools are agents of the secular pagan state. Well, what's the result? 70% of their kids go apostate. That's a curse, isn't it? That's a curse. To raise children, to spend all that money, put all that energy, all that time, and have your kids to grow up and go to hell and be pagans. It'd be better not to get married than have that. Which this obviously implies faith in Christ and the Word of God. As a result of fearing God, the people study the moral law and strive to put it into practice. So we can see in these verses the crucial importance of the inspiration, infallibility, sufficiency, perfection, and authority of Scripture. If one's view of the Bible falters, everything will degenerate and fall apart spiritually and morally. And it also reveals the incredible importance and honor that Scripture places on the moral law. This amazing respect that we see throughout the Bible for the moral law, especially in the Old Testament, we don't find among Christians today. And just a note, all the Reformed creeds and confessions, whether Dutch or German or whatever, Presbyterian, Puritan, Independent, I'm talking the original Congregationalists, the Ten Commandments are called a summary of the moral law. Any teaching commandment or statute that is moral in content outside of the Ten Commandments applies as well. People say, oh, there was this idiot article in this uh, the Reformed Presbyterian or whatever it was called, of some magazine purporting to be truly Reformed. And the guy argued that anything outside the Ten Commandments is purely positivistic and doesn't apply to us. Oh, we, you're allowed to trip a blind man? <laughs> you're allowed to hate your neighbor in your heart? That's not in the Ten Commandments. There are moral laws designed to explicate, flesh out, and explain each commandment. And we see that especially in the Westminster Larger Catechism where they use the laws outside the Ten Commandments to explain the Ten Commandments and define them. In addition, there are moral laws, case laws, that teach us how to apply these universal moral principles to specific situations in life, and even how they should be applied in civil or judicial situations. The law does this so we can apply it to our modern situation or our different situation than Israel. The law needs to be applied. We're not riding around on horses anymore. We drive cars and so on. The judicial laws in the Old Testament that are moral in content are not typical or ceremonial and thus applied to sojourners and strangers or foreigners who live within the borders of Israel. Leviticus 18, 26, 19, 15, and 35, Deuteronomy 4, 8, 16, 18, 24, 17, 33, 21, 2 Samuel 8, 15, 2 Chronicles 8, 8, Psalm 119, 102, etc., etc. Oh, I applied those to the, wrong, to the wrong spot. Anyway, the Bible teaches that the moral law is perfect and just. Romans 7, 12, and those passages I just read. Only Leviticus 18, 26 applies to sojourners. Therefore, it is far superior to the law codes of the heathen nations around Israel and should have faithfully followed by Israel serve as an example to the pagan nations. Deuteronomy 4, 5 to 8. And you hear about Calvin and people say, oh no, we just, we just follow the law of the nations, the Romans and the Greeks, and their laws were great and we follow those. Nonsense. They tolerated chattel slavery. They tolerated adultery as long as it was... Uh, done with a prostitute and not having a relationship with a woman. There's a lot, I, in my, I have a book on natural, against natural law where I, I go into great detail about how these law, these law codes tolerated all sorts of gross immorality. They weren't good law codes. Sure, everybody forbids murder, 
But if you were a Roman senator and you committed a crime, you'd be treated very leniently. If you were a slave, you'd be, you were treated super harshly. Their laws were unjust. So it's far superior to all other laws, law codes. And should have faithfully followed, serve as an example of the pagan nations, Deuteronomy 4, 5 to 8. The dispensational position which dismisses the whole Old Testament law, including the Ten Commandments, or the modern Reformed version of dispensationalism, which finds the moral law only in the Ten Commandments, to the exclusion of all moral case laws outside of the Ten Commandments, greatly reduces the ethical footprint of Scripture, and thus reduces the application of the fear of God to ecclesiastical and especially civil law orders. And I'll end, I'll end with this point here, because we're running out of time. It greatly reduces the ethical footprint of Scripture, and what does that do? It increases human autonomy and ethics. And this applies to even conservative Presbyterians, beloved. If men are not carefully searching out God's moral law and carefully applying them to culture and society, the result will be more human autonomy and ethics. And the result of this thinking has led very conservative Presbyterians in Scotland, for example, the Free Church, they, now they split, there's the Free Church, which is much more liberal and bad, and they've already accepted musical instruments in worship. And there's the much better, much more faithful Free Church continuing, which we pray for, we hope they greatly expand although we want them to accept covenanting. If they don't, they're an heir there. They were advocating status redistributive welfare and health care programs in the name of Christian love, and that was one of the reasons they condemned Christian Reconstructionism, which is one of the good things about Christian Reconstructionism, and they were condemning it, even though a biblical analysis reveals that such programs are based on what? State theft. Yeah, the state has a right to tax for what the state's responsibilities under God's law are, which are fighting crime, protecting the borders. The state has no role in charity. The state has no role to play in health care. The state has no role to play in any of these things. The Bible teaches private charity only. So when the state takes from Peter, who may make more money than Paul, because Peter went to college and Paul didn't, or Peter's a hard worker and Paul likes to smoke pot and watch TV, that's called theft. So the free church is advocating state theft, which is a violation of the law of God, which is sinful. In addition, they destroy the biblical idea of deserving poor and a private charity. That's one thing great about private charity. Private charity looks at people and distinguishes, this guy's smoking crack and he's a drug addict and he refuses to work. I'm not giving him a penny. This guy over here, his house burned down and he lost his tractor and he needs work because of a bad situation in life. It, it's not because he's immoral. We're going to help this guy. We're not going to help that guy. Biblical charity lifts people out of poverty. Statism, welfare programs, endorse and encourage poverty. They want people to be dependent on the state because it's a way of buying votes. That's all it is. Why do you think they're letting all these illegally Im immigration immigrants into the country? The Democrats look at them as future voters because most of them are dirt poor and don't speak English and they're going to be, they want to go on welfare. The state has no business in welfare whatsoever. It's based on theft. And if you don't believe me, read your Bible. The Bible does not advocate socialism. It does not advocate welfare statism. It's totally against it. It teaches free market capitalism under a strict regulations of biblical law. No false advertising, no unjust scales. And of course, the Bible teaches that if you have more, if you have, if God has blessed you, help your poor neighbors. But you help your poor neighbors that are poor, not because they're smoking crack and watching TV. I worked in wealth when I was in the 1970s. I worked in a welfare office in San Jose, California. And 98% of the people that were getting welfare were gaming the system. They didn't want to work. They collected welfare. They collected food stamps. And they sat at home and they, I mean, this one guy, they were drinking Heineken, which is expensive beer. Back then it was. And they were uh, smoking a lot of weed. We had prostitutes coming in who were making $100,000 a year doing tricks, pulling up in their Cadillacs, in black Cadillacs to get their food stamps. It's a scam. 
If a nation is to truly fear God, it can only do so by strictly implementing and enforcing a biblical law order. A nation that hates God's law and replaces it with humanistic, immoral laws is a nation that hates God and it's ripe for judgment. Judgment's coming. If our nation, if we don't have a Christian revival in this nation, and Trump's not the answer. You know, I know I've, I offend these incredible Trump. Trump uh, these, these, I have a lot of friends that are big Trump supporters, Christians, serious Christians that are Trump supporters. Christian, uh, Trump is a, a habitual liar, an egomaniac, a re repeated adulterer over and over and over again. And uh, if you think he's the answer, uh, you're wrong. He's also a big spender. He, he expanded the debt incredibly. So our answer is Christ. Our answer is biblical law, not Trump. Now, is he better than the Democrats? Obviously, way better. But don't put your hope in an adulterer who's a habitual liar and an egomaniac. You know, he's more of an insult comic than he is a good leader. But we'll leave it there. We'll come back. And uh, I find this very helpful. The fear of God is connected directly to the law and the holiness of God. We have to live a certain way because our, this, our God is holy. He demands it. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your, your word. We thank you for the fear of the Lord. Ingrain your words into our minds that we might not sin against you. Cause us to fear him every day. To think about that every day. So that we would be obedient to your holy law. That we would obey your scriptures. That we would seek to implement a Christian law order in this nation. That we would seek to uh, have biblical law instead of humanistic, satanic laws which will only bring your wrath and down on our country to help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.